Parkinson. show tonight, my guests include Mr. Jimmy Tarbuck and Mr. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Also a song from Oklahoma, currently enjoying a successful revival in the West End, performed by the new star of the show, Mr. John Dietrich. But first, someone who made his name in the pop boom of, of the 60s by writing, Everyone's Gone to the Moon. ...produced groups such as Genesis and 10CC, in addition to St. Cecilia and the Piglets, who were not related, but were rumored to be him, operating under a pseudonym. His attitude to the business of pop, his refusal to take it seriously, has made him a controversial figure, particularly among those music critics who would have you believe that pop music is more a religion than an entertainment. Thus, one critic said of him, and I quote, he has made a living out of reducing pop stroke rock formulae to their most cretinous and ergo most commercial level. So there. Ladies and gentlemen, suitably uncontrite, Mr. Jonathan King. I, th I think they were the original musicians on it, you know. Were they? Yes, I think a lot of them were. I see. Well, look, listen, reducing pop rock to its most cretinous level, a manipulative dilettante, and one I don't understand, the butterfly that's stamped. Yes. What is it about you that makes people react in this way? It's, I think it's, it's actually fairly apt. I'm, I'm pleased to have so many compliments thrown in my direction. You regard it as a compliment, do you? Yes, I really don't take life seriously on any level. I'm probably the ultimate cynic. They do say the cynics are the greatest lovers of humanity. Mm. Um, I really think that if, if you can't find something to laugh about in almost any situation, life just isn't worth living. But why is it, do you think, though, that the, the writers on pop rock music do take it so seriously, because they do, don't they? Oh, yes, but it's not just the music industry. I mean, I'm now, currently, I'm living in New York, and I've been covering the presidential elections for, for the BBC, for Radio 1 and Radio 4 originally. And I find that the people who take life seriously are anybody covering any kind of news. See, I have this great belief that it's the media, it's us, that is Big Brother for 1984. We're all being brainwashed, slowly but surely. We're the ones who rule this country and the world. We're the ones who totally dominate everybody's minds. Everything that we say now, you there are thinking at this moment. I'm getting all sorts of invidious thoughts into their brain. Because most of them don't have any brains. No, that's not true, actually. Most, you don't, of them, you don't no, that. most of them would, in fact, listen to what you have to say and then make their own mind up. They'd either think you're a fool or a wise man. Well, Michael, I had a TV chat show when I was a youth. Uh, way back in the late 60s on the commercial TV channel opposite Simon D. Remember what happened to him? Anyway, and I used to do this show every week on Saturday early evenings and at one point I turned to camera, camera three, camera one and said, of course the public are all idiots. And I got thousands of letters from people saying, yes, we agree with you, Jonathan, they are. Well, they, no, well, they said, we must be idiots to watch you. That's what they probably said. <laughs> Might have been a point, Might yes. have been a point. No, I don't think you can treat your audience like that, actually. I think that's, that's, that's not being cynical. That's being uh, recklessly stupid to, to assume that. Well, you see... And I, I don't but furthermore believe that, in fact, we are shaping opinion. You see, I don't think that anything that ever happened on television changed anybody's mind about anything. Well, I think everything that happens on television is brainwashing us all relentlessly, again and again, without us knowing it. Not in a blatant, open way, but in a very subtle, dangerous way. I really, I fear the media enormously. You? We are very, very strong and getting stronger. Well, then, well, let's, let's turn that media thing, then. What about the effects of pop music? I mean, how dangerous would you see that? Or if, if, if you would see it as a danger? I think um, pop music is very, very powerful, and people should be careful what they do in pop. I was... I've always been very anti-drugs as a matter of interest since my early days in university and in the music industry. I was very against the Beatles when they came out and said that they experimented with LSD and so on. I thought it was a very dangerous thing to do because a lot of kids listen to what they say. When one of the Beatles went on a campaign about Ireland and his own instant remedies for how to solve an incredibly and unbelievably complicated problem there, I resented that as well. I think even more subtly, pop music can influence people in their own attitudes and, and opinions. I think it's certainly one of the things that young people pay attention to. What, what do you th but do, 
would pop music change them for the better or for the worse, their opinions and their attitudes? I think it can be both, yes. as indeed television and the media as a whole can be. Yes. But what worries me is that uh, the media is, so, is, is controlled by lots and lots of people. There's no one specific person. But what happens is obviously that the, the opinion of the majority in the media comes through and is pushed forwards as what should be acceptably held to be so. And as a result, they can stop and start wars. They can elect and, and kick out of office presidents. I mean, I always believed that the whole Watergate thing was a real drop in a bucket. I thought it was really not that serious at all. I didn't think Richard Nixon was a great president, but I certainly think he didn't deserve to be kicked out of office for a series of events which the media led him on to, simply because it was good for circulation, good for ratings. It was nonsense, absolute nonsense. I mean, his downfall was a result I'm winding of him up, you know. a brilliant investigative journalism, the press properly fulfilling its role in society. He was caught with his hand in the till. I mean, let's, let's be fair, and he deserved, therefore, what he got. And then what the Americans got next was a very fine, honest man who never would even dream of putting his hand in the till, not even to help and save the country he was representing, and who turned out to be probably, according to the latest vote, the worst American president in the history of American presidents. I think you need someone who's a bit devious and will work preferably on your behalf if you've elected them. Um, to get something done. I always thought Harold Macmillan, who was a marvellous Prime Minister, was marvellous because he was also a bit devious and a bit tricky, and he manipulated people, and he knew what he was doing. Well, he's what we would call a consummate politician, I exactly, would think. Exactly, yes. Right. But where then, if going on this American pol uh, politics thing, because you've been, as you say, reporting it, where do you place then uh, Mr Reagan? Uh, I was really not in favour of him. When I, when I started off there, I got in very interested at the beginning of the year. It was a, a fairly major decision for me because I've been doing very well in the music industry. I had a lot of job offers for lots of sums of money to stay in the recording industry as an executive. But I decided to take the year off, go and write a novel, which I've done, and it's brilliant. Oh, oh no, no, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did that for the first few months. Nobody out there thought it'd be anything other than no, brilliant. No, no, no. You didn't need to say it. Kind of you to say so. Yeah. And, and at the same time, I was covering the election for the BBC. Every Saturday afternoon at 2 on Radio 1, a king in New York. Just like, get that in. Mm. Uh, and the first thing I did was meet um, some of the candidates. And I decided that John Anderson had something to offer. Now, at the time, everybody decided he hadn't. And <laughs> at the election, most of them decided to. But at least he did end up as one of the three. Had a lot of meetings with him, a lot of talks with him, and decided that of the three candidates, eventually, he was probably the best. Um, but I then thought, when he didn't stand a chance, that Carter was better than Reagan. Reagan has made some very strange statements. I like what? Well, I, I've, I've actually got some quotes, because I don't really want to misquote him. Um, George Bush, his running mate, is somebody... George Bush made actually my favourite remark of the entire campaign, which was, we made the wrong mistake. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to elect somebody for talking dramatically, George Bush will be a fine vice president. <laughs> but um, Ronald Reagan on, on, ev on evolution made, made an interesting comment that I think Darwin would have liked to have heard. He said, recent discoveries down through the years, which is again quite interesting to start with, have pointed up great flaws in the evolution theory. Uh -huh. So you notice that. And the other thing that, that one of my favourite things was he did come up with this theory that air pollution which we all suffer from enormously, was mainly caused by trees. Yes. Which again was <laughs> quite interesting. And apparently his exact quotation was that growing and decaying vegetation, I suppose in which category you could put me, in this land are responsible for 93% of the oxides of nitrogen. Yeah. Well, the, the San Jose Mercury News did, did a rather good editorial in which they said, um, put the president of the Sierra Club, which is an you know, evolutionary club, in a sealed garage with a tree. Put Ronald Reagan in a sealed garage with a running automobile. Wait to see which one of them yells to get out first. <laughs> I thought it was fun. You obviously got a lot... Are there more fun American elections than British elections? Because you had a close-up of both, haven't you? Yes. Um, I, I love doing it. I, I stood as an independent here. Did very well in a by-election and disastrously in a general election, but enjoyed myself enormously and found it was the most incredible way of getting to know the political system, which one otherwise wouldn't do. Um, having done that, I thought the American election would be worth studying. The conventions are madness and great fun. And showbiz. Yes, real showbiz. Mm. Uh, the election itself was meant to be marvellous. It turned out to be television's first major case of premature ejaculation. 
<laughs> well, you see, what was happening was all the media was ready to cover this election. It was going to be a close-fought race down to the wire, which is an expression they love using, right the way along. All the, they have three major networks in, in America, CBS, ABC, and NBC, plus a few independent stations in each town. And they were all ready to cover the election. They spent millions on computers so that they could beat the others at predicting who the winner would be and everything. One commercial station, Channel 9, who has Benny Hill and Morecambe and Wise on, incidentally, so they have got some taste, um, they started and they decided we're not going to get into this battle. We're going to show the deer hunter from start to finish. At 8 o'clock in the evening it was going to begin when the polls closed. And the network said, well, they're mad. Everybody's interested in the election, right? So they all got themselves prepared and sitting down, and then the voters went and voted. And they did something which was unheard of. The media had told them not to do it. You might be right, Michael. They might not be brainwashing us. Because within about five minutes of the, the polls was closing, the game was up. It was a landslide. And everybody was watching Deer Hunter. Everyone was watching the Deer Hunter. <laughs> swept the race in. Interesting <laughs> idea. I thought Granada had the right idea here, where they put that American night on with all the sort of soft porn and yes, that sort of thing. Yes, I think a lot of people wished it had been available all around the country. I do too, absolutely. It had been very, very interesting indeed. The ugly George show. Yeah. It's so bad, you Is wouldn't it? believe it. But what about, let's go back to you in, 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 in this country. No, let's talk about that book then that you, you read. My your, brilliant first your novel. Your brilliant first yeah. novel, which in fact, you, did you publish it privately? No, well actually, I've been writing before and I've published privately things that I didn't really think were, were good enough to publish. I wrote a children's story called The Polish Boy and the Pope which was a fun little children's story. I sent a copy to the Pope and got back a letter yeah. saying he'd read it and enjoyed it greatly and gave me his blessing, which I thought was very nice. Yeah, it was yeah. a charming, a really nice letter. Mm -hmm. um, but Had he heard of you? I think probably, yes. Um, yes. I usually assume that people have. Yes, yes, that's right. Are you sending me up? Mark? No, no. I <laughs> you get that feeling? No. Um, and so I went, when I went off to America, I thought, now, I really, I've always wanted to be eventually a writer. I've had great 15 years in the music business, the entertainment business, it's been great experience. But I really want eventually to end up being a writer, because I love, I read a lot, I studied English literature at Cambridge, mm. you got my degree in that. Not the world's greatest degree, but straight through. And so I went there and I thought, I will sit down and write a book. And I've written a book called Bible 2, about a young man's quest for love. A hard and difficult quest at the best of times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm now looking for a publisher. I have a literary agent here who's very good, looks after Len Dayton, Kingsley Amis, and Henry Root, amongst others. Oh, the dreaded Henry Root. And so hopefully yes. he will find me a slot. I think I might take a few bob off Mr. Root, actually, uh, for a charitable cause, I think, because uh, I'm in volume two of the, of the Root thing. And I do object to this man making money out of, uh, yes. out of other people. What I really about do. copyright? Well, there you are, you see. It's very interesting because, in fact, uh, you do own the copyright as a letter writer, don't yeah, you? I would imagine. So, so I, should, might, I might stick in for a few bob for a charity. Please don't. Uh, could you not broadcast this bit, please? You know, I mean, my literary agent may no, think no. that I'm responsible for <laughs> no, this. No, 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 I had no, nothing no. to do with I've this been, at all. I've been, <laughs> I've been thinking about that for some time. Does this mean, in fact, then, that, that it's going to be a fond, fair and sad farewell, tear-stained farewell to the music industry, which so loves and, and harbors Dilly you? needs me. Dilly needs um, I'm afraid probably not. <laughs> um, the thing is, I love the music industry, actually, being yeah. quite serious. And the whole entertainment business, I was just saying to Tarby, we all, everybody bumps into each other around the world and it really is a very small family and it's great fun. The music business is an even smaller family. And from the early days of when I was a little teenage sprout, highly talented at that. <laughs> um, I don't think I'm going over the top at all. No, no, no. <laughs> you find it impossible to go over the top. <laughs> Uh, there must be an answer to that. I hope Douglas Fairbanks thinks of it. <laughs> um, but I've always been involved and I've always loved it and I've had a wonderful time. And I'm sure that I will be connected on one level or another. Mm. Um, the break now is really to establish myself in America. I'm lucky enough to have got a very good slot on American radio. You know, American radio is different from England. You have hundreds of different stations. Yes, right. And the, one, the top one in New York specialising in news and conversation is yeah. WMCA. It used to be a rock station 15 years ago, and they played Everyone's Gone to the Moon as a matter of interest. Um, and I've now got the morning slot on that from 10 to 12 every morning, um, which I've just literally flown over, and I'm zipping back again tomorrow. Um, I have guests on. If you're over there, come on. Please. I'd love yeah. to, yes. Yeah, I doubt to. if I get a word in edgeways, actually. But um, <laughs> would, you, would, you, would you like to have been a pop star, though? No, I never, thank heavens, I, well, I, I've had so many opportunities, Michael. Yes, you have. I, actually, it's quite seriously, no, I have, yes, I have. I, no, I, I mean, you, you had the odd hit, you know, yeah, ranging yeah. from Paloma Blankers and uh, various other situations like it, 100 Ton and a Feather I once was and all the others. And I've always rejected the chance because, A, I'm the world's worst performer. 
it's a well-known thing in this business that if you get top of the pops when you have a hit record, it explodes into an enormous hit. Mm. The only artist who proves that so by being the opposite is me. I go on top of the pops and I do a performance of any hit I have and <laughs> boom, down go the sails. Really? Oh, it totally dies. I'm really, if you see me singing on television, it's one of the greatest comic experiences you could have. I am awful, incontrollably awful. Really? Yes. And so I, I mean, I could never be a, a singing star and a rock star. Mm. And... I'm enough aware of my abilities, which are numerous, and my yes. lack of abilities, which are few and rare, <laughs> to know that singing and being a performer is definitely not one of my talents. Oh, you're charming, shy. I think. <laughs> <laughs> do you, in fact, though, do not envy them their lifestyle, uh, Jonathan? Uh, these some of these pop stars. I mean, they are the superstars of today, aren't they? You know, yes. the massive salaries. Eltons and the rods, yeah, and all the that. Rods stuff. and all that. Yeah. No, I don't at all. Well, for a start, most of them are brainless imbeciles. You see, <laughs> <laughs> they they seem very nice. Now, you notice the musicians the, the over there. There was a laugh there that, that came through as true. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, fame comes to people, again, quite seriously, and they do behave very strangely. I mean, they really do begin to think that they are something other than ordinary mortal. Now, despite some of my remarks, I actually do genuinely believe that I am as much of a fool as you are, Michael. That's and right. We're all, we're all, we're all, we do all the same That's thing. Right. So when it comes down That's to the line right. and the final analysis, we're, we all lead ordinary lives. But it really, when fast money comes in for somebody like a rock star who perhaps was not brought up to accept it and know how to do, deal with it, and who is these days, it does tend to go to their heads and they, they lead very monotonous lives, doing boring tours relentlessly. They all get very into drugs, sniffing all that nasty white powder up their noses through used dollar bills, as the current trendy cocaine habit, they call it. Um, they really are, most of them, very boring and, uh, and fairly brainless, and they destroy themselves. Mm. And it's not a life that's fun, it really isn't. No. The music business can be marvellous as long as you keep your sense of proprieties, I think, and use it for doing whatever else you want to do. Yes. Yeah, it's lovely for me to do a year's worth of a, of a show on, on a radio in New York, which is a market I've never broken into, and have fun and express opinions. It's great to be here talking with you. Congratulations, by the way. Well, on what? On your... Uh, your job, the new job. Oh, the new job. Well, Not going to go on about it, however. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. No, seriously, and, and you very, very much do deserve it because I've zipped around the world and I've seen a lot of chat shows and been on quite a few. And there's, there's probably the two best, a Johnny Carson in America and yourself. Oh, Jonathan, coming from you, that indeed is praise. I know you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had to spit it out, actually. The words didn't want to come out of the it's, mouth. It's really praise, because I would have I I thought you'd included yourself before me in that lot doing a chat show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, now, let me, let me ask you, though. As, as somebody, I mean, you, you, I, I admire your attitude, actually, toward the business. I think you're absolutely right. And you're right that a lot of them do take it too seriously, some of these... Uh, young pop musicians and things. But, I mean, what about the, the, the music itself? How much of that do you actually think is, is lasting music? And how much is just bubblegum consumption? I think it's going through a very bad phase at the moment. I watched Top of the Pops the other night and was horrified. Recently, it was very good. I think the new wave and the punk movement was great for music. It was, it was not that professional or musically good, but it was enthusiastic, which, of course, the Beatles were in their early yes, days. Right. I think it's not been as great since the middle 60s as it could have been. But there are still some... I mean, Genesis, who is a band, as you know, was involved in. I think it's still making marvellous records. There are still a lot of very talented musicians around. I think the disco boom was actually very bad for the music industry. It created no real artists. It produced a lot of very monotonous hits that were basically rhythm without much melody and certainly no lyrics. But I think we're in for a very good upheaval now. The industry slimmed down, got rid of a lot of excess executives who were not necessary in it. And I suspect in the next year you'll see probably another explosion. And I think it'll come from Britain because there's still a lot of great talent musically in Britain. Mm -hmm. And you'll still maintain your links with it? I can't resist, really. You know, I mean, I'm trying not to desperately, but occasionally a tape lands on my desk or something, and I think, I've got to write a song about that. And there I am, lost. Jonathan, my soul is lost. Jonathan King for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you.